more like Jesus as a result. What do you want to, what do you want to say? Yeah, thank you, Vasily. Thank you for this introduction, and I believe it's a good place for me to be here, right? We don't have a clock here in this room, so I think I should use my phone as a stopwatch um, so we can so we can make sure I don't run out of time. Uh, so it's a real privilege for me to be here, and thank you for being here as well. I'm really encouraged to see that many people on such a hot day, because, you know, sometimes people, instead of going to the church, uh, tend to go somewhere, for example, to the lake or to Hood Canal or a similar place, you know, just to, just to rest and to stay close to water. Um, so I'd like to, uh, to, to talk today about an interesting subject which I believe relates to every one of us, everyone who is here and everyone who thinks he is a Christian. Because it's a great opportunity for us to think about it and actually make a decision or at least try to evaluate ourselves and see where we are in relation to God, where we stand because what Bible tell us, tells us is that there are two groups of people. There are carnal Christians and there are sp spiritual Christians, right? So carnal is a little bit like old word, and probably you can see it on the screen right now. Carnal is, uh, was, was used in, in King James Version, for example. And when we read uh, the same passage where that word was used, when we read it in the modern translation, like ESV, for example, it's called already people of the flesh, okay? So it's probably very similar. That's a kind of a little bit older version of the same notion of the same um, definition. While, while we can use people of the flesh when talking about the same nowadays. So I'd like to start with a story which um, happened back in Ukraine probably 20 years ago in the church which I attended at the time. So there was a young man who came to the church for the first time. He hadn't been a believer. It was his first visit to the church. Um, so, and and, and he, he, sit, uh, he sat through the service and he really liked it. So after the service, he comes to the pastor and, and asks him a very simple question. He's asking, how can I join your organization? That's a pretty fair question, right? If it would be somewhere at a political gathering or something like you like the platform of the party or you like some, uh, what, what for if, if it's about a nonprofit organization, you like what they're doing, probably it's a fair question to ask and say, yeah, how can I join your company or how, how can I join your organization? And, um, you know, our pastor, who happened to be my, my dad, uh, that's how I learned about this story, by the way. So he was really stunned by that question. He kind of like was caught off guard because you don't really, you know, hear that question every day. And he, it actually took him some time to sit down with this young man and to explain him that church is not just an organization. It's a living body and you cannot just join the, the church by filling out the form and saying, now I'm a member of your church. It's about changing yourself. It's about, uh, it's about repentance. It's about confession of your sins. It's about changing your nature. It's about actually surrendering, surrendering yourself to God, to, to Jesus Christ completely. And only after that you can become a member of the church. Um, so you see there is a little bit difference in mentality. And uh, unfortunately, when... Uh, when we hear questions like that, that helps us realize that there are different types of people who can call themselves Christians, who can think they are Christians, right? And uh, you, as, as I said, in this specific case, it's probably an indication that this person wasn't a spiritual Christian. He wasn't actually a believer in Jesus Christ, and he didn't really understand how uh, the church functions. So let's read one interesting passage from 1 Corinthians. It's chapter 3. Let's read it and let's talk about it. Uh, verses 1 through 8. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants of Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, but you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready yet. 
uh, for you are still of the flesh. For while there are jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. So that's the passage that we just read, and I would like to use it as the basis for our, uh, for our um, discussion or for our sermon, if you'd like, today. And I can see in this, in this little passage, I can see seven characteristics which determine if you are a carnal or if you are a spiritual Christian, right? So three characteristics of a carnal Christian and four characteristics of, of, of a spiritual Christian, right? And Bible really clearly separates carnal and spiritual Christians. Bible clearly says that, hey, those are two separate groups. And it's really dangerous to be in the first group. It's really dangerous to stay in this carnal state, to stay at this very, very, very minimal level of, of being a Christian, a, a Christian. And God actually calls us to grow and to advance in our, uh, in our relationship with God. So the first characteristic that I would like to point out, the first of three characteristics of a, of a carnal Christian would be that carnal Christians can't process solid food. Carnal Christians can't process solid food. And of course, we are talking about, about spiritual food, right? We are not talking about actual physical food that we have in our fridge at home. We're talking about spiritual food. Paul is using it just as an example. The food that you consume changes along with your age. It's at least supposed to change along with your age. All people start with milk, right? Um, and as you grow, your food changes too. It becomes more diverse, more complex. It's supposed to have more nutrients, more vitamins, and all that, you know, different chemical stuff that's, you know, that you can, you can see on the lab test, for example. That's supposed to be in your food. So, and it is a problem when a child is growing and he's not changing his diet, his or her diet, right? It's a problem when the child is, let's say, five years old already, but he's still drinking just milk. By the way, there is nothing wrong with drinking milk. I know some of us really like milk. For example, Pastor Vasily, he likes milk. So, Vasily, this sermon is not against you. Yeah, only with cookies, I know this. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I know Vasily can, can process solid food as well. It's uh, especially steaks. Everyone knows this, right? So, uh, but, but if you drink only milk all your life, that's probably not really good. You, you won't survive. You won't be able to grow. Milk has all the nutrients it's supposed to have just for the infants. And as you grow, you're supposed to transition to more complex things. The same happens in our spiritual life as well. And God calls us to grow in God and to grow in His relationship. As you grow, your understanding of God is supposed to change. As you grow, your relationship with God is supposed to be to, to improve. As you grow, spiri spiritual milk is supposed to be replaced with spiritual solid food, right? And probably you can ask a question at this time, how can I grow? How I can change my diet, my spiritual diet? And that's a very good question. I think one of the answers would be to spend more time with God. There are various ways, ways how, you can, uh, you, how you can spend your time with God. Um, you, can, you should spend more time consistently reading the Bible. If you repented 20 years ago and you haven't read the Bible just once, or maybe you read it once and you stopped, that's a problem. 
that's a problem, that's an indication that your relation, that, 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 that you are stuck at a very, very minimal level, that probably you are not really improving your relationship with God. And that's a problem nowadays. People don't like reading. People tend to read less nowadays. People just believe that they can understand more uh, or just know a lot. People tend to be more busy nowadays, so not really much time to read Bible, right? But if you read Bible consistently, you will start to understand God better. You will understand His nature better. You will understand His character, what He is, what He wants from you. And if you don't do that, that's a problem. Another way would be to spend time regularly in prayers. Um, for example, we can read that one of the, uh, one of the passages in, 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 in the New Testament tells us, pray without ceasing, right? Pray constantly, in other words. Pray at any opportunity that you have. Pray to God. And if we pass up this opportunity, we are missing out something in our relationship with God. We are not growing in the relationship with God. Try to use all opportunities to get closer, closer to God. The second characteristic that we can see here of the carnal Christians is that they demonstrate works of the flesh. And that's unfortunate. Carnal Christians demonstrate works of the flesh. In this specific place, this is chapter, uh, sorry, this is verse 3. Paul says, For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strive among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? That's the question he is asking the Christians in Corinth. He is, asking, uh, he is asking them and he is saying like, if there is enmity, if there is jealousy, if there is strife among you. And actually in another letter, Paul expands this list of the works of the flesh and he is saying, that's in Galatians 5.19, we can read, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, the same things, by the way, that we've just read, right? Feats of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And then a very, very dangerous part comes in. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God something to think about, right? So let's test our hearts. Let's see if we have some of these works of the flesh, because obviously none will have all of them. But when we read through this list, I want you guys to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling your heart. Try to see if you are not indulgent in the, you know, in the, in the, in the passions of your flesh, because it's natural for human beings to show these works of the flesh. Maybe not all of them, maybe some of them, because we all are human, we all are human beings, and um, maybe we have just one or two of them. Maybe we have, let's take a simple one, let's take jealousy, right? We often say, I'm jealous about this, like someone is going on vacation, for example, in your office or at your work, and you're like, oh, I'm jealous about that. But we usually say, say it as a joke, right? The truth is, when we are really jealous, we are not admitting that. We never will say, oh, I'm jealous because Pastor Vasily got like a better car than me, right? I will never say it. I probably will think it like this, but, but people in most cases don't say it like this. And again, I'm using Pastor Vasily as just an example, so please. <laughs> Three times, okay, there will be a fourth time, so sorry, was silly <laughs> about that. So we are, when we are talking about such things, it's very important to evaluate our hearts and to see where we stand in terms of being carnal or spiritual. Um, I remember another example from, from my church in Ukraine, and that was a very vivid example. It was a very, like, like, like bright example for me because... Um, 
it was a brother in our church who opened a small business. I don't want to go in details about that, but over a little period of time, uh, the entire church knew about his business. He used to be like a worker at a, you know, at a mine, um, because in my region there were a lot of mines uh, where people worked. So, and then he transitioned to become a businessman. So everyone learned about this. He started making a little bit of money, maybe more money than average person would make. I don't know. I uh, never counted it. So, uh, and over some time, he was, he was talking to, uh, to, to the brothers in the church, and he actually kind of like shared his, tent, his testimony. He said, I noticed that some people in the church started to treat me differently. Some people in the church started to treat me differently after they learned that he became like a businessman, right? And why does it happen? And of course, it's, it, it, he meant that they started treating him negatively, a little bit like negatively, uh, in, in, in a more negative way. Something changed in the relationship. What's the reason for that? Why would someone treat a brother who is the same brother who used to be um, how he was yesterday and the other day, why would you treat him differently? Jealousy, right? Probably jealousy is the root or the core problem for that. The third characteristics would be carnal Christians act like humans. And that's an interesting idea here, right? Carnal Christians act like humans. We can read it in verse, verse 4. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Paul is asking them, are you not being merely human? And probably you can stop me and say, hey, Eugene, stop, stop, stop. There is nothing wrong to be human, right? It's actually good to be human. It's bad when people call you that you are you are not human, or you act like an animal, or something like this, right? That's probably bad, but being a human, that's wonderful. No, but what Paul means here, what Paul says here, he says it's not good enough to be just a human. It's not good enough to act like merely a human being, because as I said, it's natural for all human beings to, to, to indulge in the works of the flesh, to do works of the flesh. And we as Christians are supposed to show the fruit of the Spirit instead of the works of the flesh, right? So that's, here is the difference. And uh, we are called to be, um, so when he says, and, and he is citing here a, or quoting here some people who are saying, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. There were divisions among them. And he's saying, you are not supposed to be like that. In Philippians uh, chapter, five verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is ESV translation. And actually, I like King James Version translation here. Uh, a little bit like, I think it's a little bit more clear. It says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And by the way, the Russian translation is very close to King James Version. Uh, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, he is saying, you are not supposed to think like humans. You are supposed to think like Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, the same that was in Jesus Christ. You are supposed to have a different thinking, a different way of thinking than the people of this world. And sometime, uh, sometimes we can see that these works of the flesh uh, appear among mature Christians, and that's unfortunately. Have you heard about divisions and arguments because of some people consider them um, Calvinists or Reformed Christians, and others consider themselves Armenians? Yeah, that happens nowadays in some churches. And that's not an indication of being spiritual Christians. So those Christians are, as I call them, mature Christians, right? They go to church probably for 10 years, 20 years, maybe 40 years. They learn some theology, and they know a lot about God. They know God, but for some reason, 
they start arguing with other people who just understand some secondary things differently. It's not the prime question of all Christianity if you can lose salvation or if you cannot lose salvation or if you are predetermined or you are not predetermined for salvation, right? But people, I, I know there are some divisions because of that. Some churches have divided because of these arguments or some divisions. And that's not an indication. This is, exactly, this is not an indication of being a spiritual Christian. And this is exactly what happened in Corinth in the day. Paul was the very first person who came to Corinth as a Christian, and he preached them. He planted a church there, and then he left. Over some time he left, and he went to another town to preach the gospel. And then another Christian came whose name was Apollos. And he was teaching, and his understanding was a little bit different than what Paul was teaching. Uh, so he taught a few other doctrines or similar doctrines, but probably not exactly as Paul taught. So those Christians started to divide in the church, and they started thinking, hey, I'm following what Paul taught. And another is saying, I'm following what Apollos taught. And then when Paul heard about this, he's writing this letter, he is writing this to his church that he planted, and, church, uh, and, and Paul is disappointed with them. He is truly disappointed, and if we continue reading this chapter, we don't have time to cover the entire chapter, of course, but if you read it at home, you will see that, that uh, Paul is talking about even bigger problems, about bigger things. He is talking that you are building on a wrong foundation, you are building your spiritual temple, your Christian life. You are building it with hay, and you are building it with, with combustible materials instead of building it with stone, gold, or silver, something like this. So that was a very problematic church, and they had those issues. And we are called to be over human feelings. We are called to be over just natural human beings. We are called to, be, to, to have God's feelings. This is what is meant in Philippians 2.5. This is what we just read. So let's not be just merely human. Let's be, uh, let, let us be or become spiritual Christians. And now let's transition to other four characteristics because we are, don't have too much time and I will try to speed up a little bit here. Um, the fourth characteristic or the first characteristic of, of, of Christian, uh, of spiritual Christians, is spiritual Christians seek to build up the body of Christ. They seek to build up the body of Christ. And we can read this in chapter in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. This is what Paul is saying here, and he says that spiritual Christians like Paul are looking for opportunities to serve and do something that the Lord assigned to them. They're not looking to do something of their own. They're looking to do something that God assigned to each of us. And when you're doing something that God assigned to you to do in the church, you are building up the church because you are not working against the body of God. You are working along. You are working with them. You are building up. You are, you are creating. You are adding up to what God has already put in place. This is what it meant to be, to be a spiritual Christian. So we are called to be and to do what God has called us to do. I can give you an example of William Carey. It's one of the, probably you heard about this great missionary who was born in 1761, okay? So it's almost 300 years ago. The, he was born in England and, and, and when he was 32 years old, he left for India because at that time India was a British colony and those people were just pa pagans. They didn't know Christ. So he had this passion to save people. He was a pastor, by the way, in England. And um, he had a very interesting and, and, and tragic life, I would say. He, he is, and his wife, Dorothy, they had seven children. Two of them died in infancy. 
when they moved to India, he actually sold out all his belongings to just gather money to buy the tickets for his family to go to India. So he sold out everything. He purchased the tickets. They moved to India. Over some time in India, uh, one of his sons died because of the um, because of some of the tropic disease, and uh, and uh, over several years, um, several years later, his wife. Um, literally became insane. She suffered a debilitating mental breakdown and, and she, she didn't come to a normal state anymore. So she was living with him, with the family. Uh, she was very difficult to deal with and actually all the friends who were around him, they urged him to commit her to an asylum. But he refused. He said that this, she is my wife, I'm supposed to care for her and he cared for several years until her death, he cared for her. Um, and, and when she died, he was, he was really broken by this, um, by this event in his life. And in one of his letters to his friends in England, he was writing and he said the following. He said, I don't understand why God took my family, but I remain faithful. I don't understand why God took my family, but I remain faithful to God. So he continued to serve. He remarried again in, in India, and uh, he served uh, in India for the rest of his life, and he died, and he, was, uh, he is buried in India. So that's, that's just an example of the person who is seeking to do what God assigned to him. It's an indication of the person who is a spiritual Christian, who doesn't want to do carnal things, who doesn't want to follow the works of the flesh, who just, even when he didn't understand what God, why God did, did those things to his family, why he lost his wife, why he lost three of his seven children, he still remained faithful. Another characteristic is spiritual Christians don't take credit for their works. I'm not talking about financial credits, okay? I'm talking about credit when we're taking credit for something we did, right? Or we, we have done. So spiritual Christians don't take credit. They give the credit to God, okay? Uh, it's written in verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. Hey, actually, it would be very, very natural for Paul in this situation change the story and say, hey, Corinthians, stop it. I'm the one who planted the church. I'm the one who is the reason for your salvation because I was the first one to come here and preach the gospel to you. But we don't see this happening. Instead, he is saying, Look what he is saying. He is saying, so neither he who plants nor he who waters are anything, but only God who gives the growth. He is giving the credit to God. He is saying, it's not my, it's not my merit. It's not something that I did right. He is saying that this is God. This is because of God. And actually, when we read uh, Luke 17, 10, we can read that, what Jesus told his disciples and he told them exactly the same. By the way, Paul was not among those disciples, but he is thinking alike. He is thinking in the same way. He is, this is what Jesus told his disciples. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what, we, what was our duty. We are unworthy servants. We have done only what was our duty. That's really interesting, right? It's natural for us to take credit for our achievements, for our good works, for something that we have done. Instead of this, God says, no, -uh. say we are unworthy servants and give the credit to God because He is the reason for everything that we have here. He is the reason for our salvation. He is the reason for all we are doing. Um, the next one, or, or characteristics number three of spiritual Christians, is that they seek unity. Spiritual Christians seek unity. 
verse 8 says, He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. He who plants and he who waters are one. And he is talking here about unity. He is saying that actually what I did for you in Corinth and what Apollos did for you, we served the same goal. We worked towards the same, the same aim, the same goal, and we want you to think the same. We want you to understand that those who are in God, those who are real Christians, those who are true Christians, you are supposed to work towards unity. You are supposed to build up the body of Christ. As I said, Paul could, could have taken credit for the work and the ministry he has done in Corinth. And the, uh, however, he is saying, no, I'm not the reason for your salvation. I'm, I'm, I'm just a servant of God. And um, change, change your thinking instead of thinking, I'm a Paulus, and another is thinking, I'm, I'm Paul's. Think that both Apollos and Paul served towards the same goal. And in that case, instead of division, you will have unity in your church. Let's seek unity in Jesus Christ. And that's what I would like to point out today. Um, and last but not least is um, characteristics number seven or number four of spiritual Christians. Spiritual Christians will receive reward. This is the last one for today. Spiritual Christians will receive reward. Scripture, it, it's actually said in this verse 8, he says that each will receive his wages according to his labor. He's pointing out towards some remuneration or about some, 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 some wages, some, some, some kind of payment for the work you've done, if I may say it like this, right? So he's saying he's pointing out to a reward in heaven. And we know that God in other places in the Bible, he's saying that there are different types of crowns that he will give to, uh, he will give to those who will, who will achieve the heaven, who will achieve the kingdom of God. At least we know three different crowns. For example, crown of righteousness. We know crown of life. We know crown of glory. And I don't understand at this time, living on the earth, probably you don't understand it either, how it looks like. Either we are going to wear those crowns or what's gonna, how it's going to look like. We don't know. But God has clearly indicated that there are some rewards that He will give those who act towards unity, who build up the body of Christ, who try to serve God, who work towards unity and who are, who are just spiritual Christians. God says that He will reward those who serve because they are spiritual Christians. They serve because they understand the reasons for serving. Friends, it's time to evaluate ourselves today. It's time to think twice or maybe three times of where our relationship with God is today, where it stands. Are we a person of flesh? Or are we a spiritual Christian? Who we are? Sometimes you hear in a piece of advice in the church is that, hey, never do business with that person or that person, right? Have you heard such, such rumors or, or such recommendations from other people? Like, never do business with him. He will, he will leave you broken, right? Broke. He will leave you broke because, because this person never returns money back or something like that. That's an indication of carnal Christianity. It's not supposed to be like that in a church, in a church of God. I hope it's not about ourselves. However, it will never, it's never, it will never hurt to check your heart and see where you are in your relationship with God. Who are you today? Where do you stand? And I would like to pray now with all of you and to see where my heart is today. And if I see that I'm still showing those works of the flesh, if I still have some indication or demonstration in my life of this carnal 
uh, carnal emotions or carnal feelings, that's against the will of God. I need to change. I need to change my life today instead of waiting that maybe over 10 years I will slowly work on my character, on my, on my nature, and I will change it. No, you won't be able to change it. It's only because of God. Only God can help you change it. And only God can lead you this road to, to spiritual to being a spiritual Christian. So let's stand up and pray, and um, I encourage everyone to bow, your bow down your head and pray to God and ask for His wisdom, ask for, His, um, for, for the Holy Spirit to work on your heart and to see the depth of your heart, to see where exactly you stand today in your relationship with God, and if necessary, may God help you change it. Our oh Lord, we are coming to you. We